There are many days when news events can be overwhelming and even lead to a pessimistic sense of the world, especially after tragedies like the shooting in Florida. But it may help to take the much longer view, and that's the focus of a conversation our economics correspondent Paul Salmon has tonight. It's for his weekly series, Making Sense. Despite what you read on the news, humanity has been uh, getting better off. That's right, better, psychologist Steven Pinker insists. All too often, something happens, there's a terrorist attack, there's a horrific killing, there's a market plunge, and all of a sudden it's a symptom of a sick society and of a downward spiral. But in his new book, Enlightenment Now, Pinker accentuates the positive, to the delight of superfan Bill Gates, for instance, who's dubbed it his favorite book of all time, even produced a trippy video about it. Well, I loved Better Angels of Our Nature. I'm even more thrilled about your next book, Enlightenment Now. Better Angels argued that violence has been plunging worldwide for centuries. Enlightenment Now insists pretty much everything has. Few of us die of disease and starvation. Few of us are illiterate. Uh, few of us are victims of violent crimes. Few of us die in wars. Few of us live under dictatorships. I'm doing this as the economics correspondent because the end goal of economics is welfare. And you're saying that overall, net welfare for humankind has never been better and is getting better all the time? It's never been better. Uh, whether it will continue to get better depends on whether we continue to um, seek human well-being as our goal, as opposed to, say, the glory of the, the nation or the race or the faith, uh, whether we continue to develop science and technology, whether we continue to apply reason and not fall back on superstition and fallacies, which we know, as psychologists, humans are, are vulnerable to. And, uh, by the way, it is economists who tend to be more optimistic, I think because they're more in tune with data showing that societies really do get richer. For most of human history, Life expectancy at birth was pinned to about 30 years. Pinker pushes his case with data in the book and on the hustings, recently at the World Economic Forum at Davos. Our chance of dying in a car accident has been reduced by 96% from the 1920s. We're 88% less likely to be mowed down on the sidewalk, 99% less likely to die in a plane crash, 96% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. Well, but I mean, Life expectancy in the United States has gone down now for two years in a row. Does that begin to suggest that we've crested? Right. No, it doesn't. Uh, no, absolutely not. The United States is just one country. And the, uh, one of the reasons for the deceleration is the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, the fact that there is a crisis doesn't mean it's going to last forever and that we're never, ever going to figure out any way to make it any better. You write about sweet commerce an idea that started in the 1700s, I guess, um, and how commerce basically begets peace, people getting along with one another. And you quote uh, famous conservative economist Ludwig von Mises, if the tailor goes to war against the baker, he must henceforth bake his own bread. Therefore, he doesn't go to war. You can't take the pursuit of self-interest, liberal democracy too far? Oh, you can definitely take it too far, but you can also take it not far enough. And empirically, commercial states, uh, at least today, tend to be less warlike than, uh, than, than protectionist states. But is it not arguable, at least, that we've moved so far in the pursuit of the fruits of commerce that we've sort of lost sight of the cooperative aspects of it? That's possible. It's certainly possible when you have monopolies, when you have fraud, when you have resources that no one owns, like the atmosphere, where no one pays for the, the, the advantages they get from polluting it. I should also add, I spent a lot of pages on what I consider to be the biggest threats to mm -hmm. progress. Yes. They include climate change. They include the possibility of nuclear war. They include the possibility of economic stagnation, and they include the rise of authoritarian populism. Indeed, I think it's only by acknowledging the darker side of human nature that we can single out what it is we're trying to, uh, to minimize. But do you not think that at the moment in history, the darker impulses of human beings aren't coming to the fore all over the world? 
Uh, they are, and but they always they always have been. I mean, things weren't so great in the 1970s when you had civil wars raging all over the world. When you had the war in Vietnam, killing uh, ten times as many people as die in wars today. Uh, in the 1980s, when you had the most uh, of the world living in dictatorships behind the Iron Curtain or in military states in Latin America and East Asia. So yeah, there are threats, but the fact that there are threats now doesn't mean that they're worse now. They were, they were pretty bad in the past too. But you're basically placing your bet on liberal democracy and saying things have been getting better and better and the Freedom House just came out with its 2018 report uh, and I quote, democracy faced its most serious crisis in decades in 2017, as its basic tenets, including guarantees of free and fair elections, the rights of minorities, freedom of the press, and the rule of law came under attack around the world. 71 countries suffered net declines in political rights and civil liberties with only 35 registering gains, 12th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. A couple of things. First of all, I never use data from any website that has a button that says donate. <laughs> uh, because advocacy organizations always cry crisis. There's certainly been a deceleration in democratization. But remember, the I mean, you and I were alive in the 1970s. There were 31 democracies in the world at the time. Now there are, depending on how you count, uh, 105. Whether you think Pinker a prophet of progress or its prime PR shill, you have to admire his book's purpose. It just puts the events of the day into context, and it prevents people from becoming uh, fatalistic, thinking, there's uh, no point in trying to solve problems uh -huh. because everything is hopeless. Yes. So why support? I think there's a lot of that now. I, I think that I think that's a, a severe problem that people become so cynical about our ability to deal with problems that they either withdraw from politics altogether or embrace uh, uh, radicalism. The calls to smash the machine, to drain the swamp, to burn the empire. Uh, to, to hand power to a charismatic uh, would-be dictator who says, only I can fix it. That's appealing if you think that the incremental technocratic solutions are failing. It's only when you zoom out and you look at the historical trajectory, you realize that some of these incremental measures really can work over the long run. But we're all worried about the here and now. That's what your readers, like me, are going to be thinking when they hear this argument not to worry, or not to worry so much. It, it, the book never says not to worry. No. Quite the, it, in fact, quite the contrary. Worry because the people who worried in the past led to the improvements that we, uh, we see today. That's why it has to be enlightenment now. This is a call to arms. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Progress doesn't happen by magic. It happens to the extent that we uh, embrace what I identify as the ideals of the Enlightenment, of reason and science and humanism. That's uh, what gave us the progress that we've enjoyed, and that uh, the imperative is to rededicate ourselves to those ideals so that we'll enjoy more progress in, in the future. For the PBS NewsHour, this is economics correspondent Paul Salmon, corresponding from Cambridge, Massachusetts.